Well, I'm the product of, of a high school romance. I say that because my, you know, my parents, they, they started dating in high school and, um, you know, they liked each other. They played in a band together and, and so they, you know, they were attracted to each other as high schoolers are, right? And uh, it all kind of culminated into prom night. I, what a cliche thing, right? And on prom night, I was conceived, and nine months later, here I was. To two seniors in, in high school who, you know, didn't really think through all those things, and I don't know, it just, it all happened so quickly, I'm sure, for them. Fast forward to the fact that they now had a, now had a newborn, trying to figure out how to provide for this newborn and everything. My dad got an opportunity to move to Oklahoma and help my grandfather out in the oil industry. And so here they are, they're newlyweds. You know, they felt like they had to get married because now they have a newborn. So they're newlyweds and they're now moving to Oklahoma. Everything, everything had to just been absolute craziness for them. Life came at them quickly. The foundation of their relationship was based solely on, you know, the, the nature of lust and in the heat of a moment. And now all of a sudden life came at them really quickly. So as we moved to Oklahoma, I mean, my, my parents, you know, started drifting apart as my dad worked and my mom tried to figure out what to do with her life. And she got involved actually in the church and uh, that actually helped, helped to kind of move them further apart. My dad didn't want anything to do with the church. Uh, my, my mom nor my father were raised in a, in a Christian home. And so this is a very, very new thing for them. And so my father moved back to Worcester. My mom actually stayed in, in Oklahoma. Um, she got involved in this church and eventually, uh, with my help and helping uh, at a softball game one night, I was throwing my sandals at this guy and uh, that helped spark a, rela a relationship between what would be my stepfather and my mother. And I'm very, very thankful for them. And uh, I'm thankful for the way that they, they raised me. They, they raised me with the understanding that they needed to have the Bible as this cornerstone of, of their faith and in all that they did. And let me just kind of fast forward to, to let you know too that my dad and my stepmom both have come to know Jesus and are, and are Christians. And it's just very, very thankful for the way that God used something that could have been, and that could have been detrimental to my life. Um, but God got a hold of my parents' hearts. And I'm very, very thankful for that. And, you know, it, it just reminded me of just in the midst of, like, in the midst of storms, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of, like, you know, that whole idea of having to uproot everything and move, they had nothing to kind of, they had nothing to really stand on. Because their, their foundation was made on all these things that were pretty wish-washy, if you will. I'm thankful for my parents. They always, they always seem to, you know, to, to go back to that foundation, to go back to those biblical values of, of knowing that they needed to raise me um, to love God first and foremost. And, and I'm very, very thankful. They, they knew that um, anchoring my life to the solid rock, to Jesus Christ, would be the only thing that would help to, to give me that foundation as I then grew into a man. And I think we've all experienced this in some way during life, this, this understanding of what it's like to live in this shaky foundation. I mean, look at what, truly, look at what our, our culture has become. You know, we live in a culture that was once founded on biblical truth and in, in, in this acknowledgement of surrendering and submitting to God. Now, the only evidence Truly, one of the only evidences of that we were once a, a nation under God is that it's written on our currency. Our fractured culture has based its foundation on it's all about me. It's what can I gain? What, how, can I, how can I better myself? 
but a foundation built on God and the foundation that his church is promoting is all about others and what what we can do for God and what we can do for those who are hurting. And have you ever noticed that that when there's, when there's some big tragedy, people seem to flock back to the church or ask about religion. I think back to my time, you know, when, uh, man, when 9-11 happened, when, when, the, when the planes hit those towers on September 11th, I was actually, I was working at a, um, this Christian bookstore as a, probably a senior in high school, I think at the time. And, uh, those next, those next like four to eight weeks, we couldn't keep any version of the Bible in stock in our, um, in our business. You know, Bibles were flying off the shelves, books about Christianity and about, and about God were flying off the shelves. We couldn't keep things in stock because people just felt like, wow, the, the world is ending. I need to know more about God. Whereas if they just would make God the, the foundation of their life, then when those devastating things come, we cling to him. We don't cling to whatever feels right in the moment. See, I know this. Your foundation determines how you overcome life's storms. Because storms will come. That's inevitable. We see that in Jesus' life. Storms come. But how we react or how we combat those storms will always fall completely on what our foundation is built on. So today we're going we're gonna to read out of Matthew, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. And it's a story that summarizes some of the lessons or, or as Jesus, uh, these parables, these stories that he would tell. Uh, and, and if you want to even go back, Matthew 5 is from the Sermon on the Mount. Some really, really good, um, some good foundational material uh, for those who are wanting to, to learn more about, you know, what Jesus said and his teachings. Um, and so we're going to be out, out of Matthew 7 uh, this morning. And if you, if you don't know, it's a, this is the, the first book of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, these, are, these are just accounts. These are accounts of these, of these disciples and of how they saw Jesus' Jesus's life and ministry lived out. Uh, we're going to break this up into two different sections this morning today, and so um, we'll, we'll start with the kind of the, the first part and talk about it and go into the second part. So it says, Matthew, starting uh, with verse 24, it says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The Hebrew Bible often employed, often employed the rock image for the security of Israel, uh, that the, for the security Israel had in God if they obeyed him, including in a time of flood or disaster. The storm could represent any test, but surely represents especially the final test, the day of judgment. And I, I, find it really, I find it really cool that Jesus is used as his knowledge of carpentry to talk about this need for stability and a solid foundation. It's just another reason why we should, we, we too should find ways to use our God-given passions and talents um, in, in our experiences as part of our ministry to help tell others about Jesus. Um, because you, God has planted you in that sphere of influence for a specific reason. You may be the only, the only uh, Christ-centered figure in, in some of your, your friends' or family's lives. And so the Bible, gives us, the Bible gives us all the truth and all the things that we need to be able to, uh, to live and, and, and grow in him. But I think Jesus also says, as he shows here, like, use what these talents and these experiences I've given you to help showcase how awesome, how, how awesome I am and how great God is. So here, as we start off, as we start in on this, this story, Jesus describes these two men. Um, and, and here in the first one, he's describing this, this, this man who built his house on, on, on this rock. And Jesus doesn't, doesn't go into great depths about who these men were. He didn't talk to about their skills or the resources they had. The only thing he points out is where 
each of those builders chose to build their house. Jesus noted, based on the choices, that one man had a wise choice and one was foolish. Something that Jesus also didn't speak to was the why behind the wiser man building his house on the rock. I sometimes get lost in these stories and these, these kind of, you know, wishing I kind of knew all the backstory of all these people. You know, did, like this man, if he was so wise to build his house on the rock, you know, did somebody teach him how to do that? Was he born also like Jesus? Was he born a carpenter's son or somebody who had this, these great experiences? You know, I don't, I don't know all those things. But we do know this. You know, building a house on rock would be extremely difficult. It would take a lot of uh, strength and persistence. Making sure that that, that house is level and secure would, would be an unbelievable task in itself. The patience, the work ethic, and the persistence it would take would be a testament to this man's um, work ethic and the type of man he would be. But at the end of the day, you know, his house being built on the rock would ensure his safety and his house, his house safety when those rough storms come crashing down. Your foundation determines how you overcome life's storms. As we move on to the, to the second part of the story, it says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. So the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew against that house, and it, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So now the foolish builder, this is, Jesus doesn't say, like, this is necessarily some bad guy. He just didn't have the knowledge or didn't have the work ethic or um, maybe the fortitude to, to, or, or, or forward thinking to build his house on rock. And I do wonder if he just didn't want to mess with how hard it would be to do that. Building your house on rock, as we said, that would be a difficult thing. So maybe he was just in a, in a hurry to have it now. This, this, should, this is something that we do as a, as a culture and society today, right? We want it now. Prime now. I'll just order ahead so I can pick it up now. But obviously he had, you know, this guy had enough knowledge to know how to build a house. He just didn't have enough forward thinking into realizing how important that foundation would be. Like I said earlier, when we when we get into those those issues that come, you know, when you know, when those when that when that job that you've had for so long you felt like you you were gonna have tied up for, for years and years to come, all of a sudden you get let go because the pandemic forces your company to go under. You know? Those are real life situations we have to figure out but we don't have to worry, we don't have to fear if our life is built on Jesus Christ because we, we can know that he says, I'm gonna give you everything you need. I'll always give you everything you need. It may not be in the timing we want and it may not ever always be everything we want. But God is, he's one that can be trusted and he's always been faithful. We see that throughout scripture. So this man, obviously building on the sand will require less time and a lot less energy. He would get what he wanted a lot sooner. He wanted that satisfaction now. And I guess he also didn't think, you know, think of the fact that maybe those storms would come. Maybe he just thought, you know, that'll never happen to me. I don't have to worry about those things. But inevitably, those storms did come. Those waves did come crashing down. Those creeks started flowing through those areas where those houses were built and only one was able to stand from those storms. See, Jesus said if we would follow him and build our lives on him, our solid rock, we will be like this wise builder. We will come through these inevitable storms of life, these trials and difficulties that are just part of life because his teachings are rock solid. They're rock solid principles for how we should live our lives. 
The house built on the rock survived this downpour, but the house on the sand was demolished. Jesus stated, and great was its fall. In other words, saying it was beyond repair. There's nothing left. It was washed out. See, I truly believe if we want to be rock solid, not only in our lives, but also for those who are around us that we love, for our spouses, for our children, you know, for, for those we're at, you know, that we're our friends at school or those people at work, we must be firmly planted on Jesus Christ and his teachings, our solid rock. See, there is only one lasting truth, and it is Jesus. Our faith cannot be planted in our pastor or in our church. Those things are good, and they're used to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our foundation. But they in itself are not our foundation. Our foundation has to be on Christ and Christ alone. And as we see in this wise man it requires a, a lot of hard work. It requires a lot of patience and persistence to do these things. But the result of knowing that you're living in, in, in truth and that you're living out what Jesus has commanded, then it will all be worth it. See, Jesus is saying that his word is the best place to build. It provides this solid foundation for our lives, for our families, for our friendships, for our future. Many times throughout the Bible, it did, we, we see this, this talk about foundation and our need to be anchored to um, this solid rock. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, man, if you don't know Paul's story, I, I, I'd encourage you to go, to go and read, read some of Paul's story. But he says in, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And David and, and wrote many of the Psalms. He writes in Psalm 18, he says, the Lord is my rock. He is my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. When the storms of life come, we can rely on our faithful faithful provider, our faithful rock, this cornerstone of our lives, Jesus Christ. Our foundation determines how we overcome life storms. So where do you begin? Maybe you're in a place where you're searching. Maybe you aren't sure of what this foundation is. Maybe you're not sure of where you start. But first, I want you to know that no matter how old you are, whether you've chosen to make Jesus a part of your life before and are coming back to that, or whether you never made that decision, you can start anytime. I'm thankful for the grace and the mercy of, of God. I've seen it lived out in, in my life if, as craziness has hit my life many, many times over, over the years, being able to hold on to Jesus. And uh, when earlier on in my life, when I strayed away from my faith in him, he was still there, waiting with open arms, ready to bring me back in and say, okay, let's start again. I think of my friend Keith here at our church. He had told me about, um, it was actually during the pandemic, it was in 2020, and he had, down in their basement, he had seen this crack starting to form on his uh, basement wall. And sure, surely enough, it was, we had a crazy amount of rain in uh, March, in the beginning of April of 2020, if you live in the Columbus area. It was insane. And so I think it was actually just, just before the pandemic, maybe like, you know, middle of March, early March, that he had seen this crack starting to form and he kept checking, kept checking it. And sure enough, in April, after a couple of weeks, this thing had come all the way, all the way down from the, the top all the way to the bottom of, of one of his walls. And um, water had begun to seep through and he had kind of done all he could. Finally got someone to come out and, and uh, they're like, yeah, so here's what happened. Whoever built your house, um, skip some steps, 
uh, didn't do all the, the proper things to, to properly reinforce this wall, so we're going to have to now reinforce this wall. And so they did a whole bunch of things, like uh, lifting, you know, they had to dig out the whole side of the house. Uh, they had to do a whole lot of new cement and pouring down holes and bracing for a long time inside and outside the house, and then finally got it shirted up and put it all back together. And now it's, now it's great. It, it, it's solid. And I just say that just as a, just a simple imagery that just because you have not made God your foundation in the past or it's been a long time does not mean he can't still do a restorative work in your life. So where do we go from here? I, I think that, um, I think if we want to make, make Christ the, the, truly the, the, the solid rock foundation of our lives, it comes down to these four things. Surrender, prayer, reading his word, and being in community. You know, if we're going to live a life of Christian abundance the way that Jesus did on this earth, it must start with surrender. We see Jesus live out this call to surrender many times in, in, in the Bible, in the three years that we really get a look at his life. All the way at the beginning of his journey in his ministry when he's tempted in the desert um, by Satan, you know, he, he, he always stayed surrendered to God. He was surrendered on the call to his life. Fast forward even to the end of his journey as Jesus is on the, or is, is on the cross or, or as he's being, you know, even before that, as he's being beaten, as he's, as he's being tortured. You know, he always, had, and we should never lose sight of the fact that, that Jesus was all God and all man. And I truly believe he had, he had every opportunity to just call it all off. But he stayed true to the call in his life, the, the mission given to him by God for God's people, for you, for me. And so he remained in surrender. That's the only way, having obviously God, his father, as his foundation and living in surrender, he was able to, as that crazy life storm came at him, as Jesus, he was able to stay in surrender. He knew his greater purpose. And obviously in prayer, Jesus was always praying. And I think that's another thing for us to remember as we, as we experience life's storms, as you're having those marriage issues that do come, as you're having other maybe relational issues that, that, you, you know, that we just experience in life, prayer doesn't have to just be this thing that we do only when we're in these in the four walls of this church or something you do before a meal or before prayer. We're commanded to pray in every situation. Throughout the New Testament, we see that before the day started, you know, or maybe after a healing or a, or a teaching time, we always see Jesus would then ret retreat to a secluded place to pray. Jesus knew that he on his own could only do so much. He needed that constant um, that constant conversation with his father. And he was always praying in the midst of, of those teachings, those healings, in the midst of, of talking to his disciples. He was always in prayer. He utilizes a prayer as a way to praise his father and to ask for, for energy, to ask for guidance. He kept, Jesus kept those lines between he and God open at all times. So he was always in alignment with that, that solid rock foundation. We need that as well. Jesus gave us kind of a blueprint for what that looks like to, to, to reinforce our foundation through prayer. Also reading the word. The, the Bible is truly a gift. It is truly a gift given to us to help us live out these things that Jesus and God has commanded and when you read the Gospels, right, as we said before, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they give us this sense of how Jesus lived. He based his, his teachings on the laws and the principles revealed in those early scriptures. 
reading the, the, the entire Bible, including both the Old and the New Testaments, it deepens our understanding of God. It deepens our understanding of how God thinks and explains even more the message uh, Jesus taught while he was here on earth. Our foundation is strengthened by knowing his word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, uh, again, the Apostle Paul, he says, all scripture is God-breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, the Bible is a powerful foundation for living wisely and abundantly, weathering those inevitable storms of life and moving forward. And lastly, um, one that's also very, very dear to my heart, as I stand you know, in the place that I do a lot of community in, is this need for community and discipleship. The man who built his house on the solid rock, he was taught. He had to have been. In some ways, he was taught. And so obviously in, in, that, in that parable, we're talking about being, being taught how to build, right? But in a very real and, 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 and spiritual sense, like we all need that. We all need someone to come alongside us to help teach us from their, from their knowledge of, of Scripture and their experience and what they have actually been through. People around us have been through a whole lot more or in, in different scenarios that we have, and they have something to teach us. That's what community is all about. It is essential that we are finding people in our lives that we can do life with and that we can be sharpened by. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And Paul says in Romans 1, 11 through 12, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may mutually be encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. We grow together. We help teach and we help guide so that when those storms come, you have this solid foundation of Jesus Christ to stand on because you've been taught and because you've um, invested time in these four things to help strengthen that foundation. You see, we were intended to do life together. I truly believe that's why Jesus had those disciples because he needed people to do life together, to minister together, to to, to also be able to share in his, his struggles, to be able to share when he was having a hard time, but also be able to teach and to help um, minister and so that when he was gone from this side of eternity, they had the tools they needed to, to continue this mission on. Here at our church, we, we call doing life together as an acronym, living intentionally for eternity with other like-minded people, doing this will strengthen our foundation. But not only do I want to build my foundation for life on the solid rock, but I want others around me to do the same. And I want to know that I have, you know, that I have people that I can, that I can teach and someone that I can help, help guide as well because somebody did it for me. I want to help others because I've been helped as well. And so that may be, you know, my wife and maybe my kids. Maybe it's a friend, but I know that God has called me too to make disciples. And if I'm going to be rock solid in my marriage and my parenting at work or even at the grocery store, my foundation has to be in Jesus. And if the church will just choose to make these four things a priority, then our communities, our workplaces, our schools, I truly believe will look a whole lot different because they'll look a lot more like Jesus. Like I said, we live in a culture that's foundation is all about me. But I think if, I think if our people would live these things out, our culture begins to look differently. Our culture begins to see begins to see that foundation of in God we trust come come back to the forefront. Your foundation determines how you overcome life storms. 
Those storms are going to come. They will. I wish I could say they don't. But they will. And Jesus experienced them himself. We don't know exactly when. We don't know exactly how to prepare ourselves for every single one of those storms. But um, when they come, when our, when our faith is firmly planted on Jesus, we can say, I don't know. I don't know what to do here. But I know I'm going to trust you. I know I'm going to surrender this moment. I know I'm going to, I'm going to surrender this storm to you. And then I'm just going to let you lead me. I'm going to let you guide me. Realizing that we have no way of surviving without Jesus being our foundation. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the way that your, your word and your spirit helps to guide, direct, and build us up. God, I pray that this word would Speak to somebody's life today as it has molded my life, impacted me for my lifetime. We thank you today for your grace and your mercy that has been afforded to me so many times, and I'm very, very grateful. And God, as we continue to learn how to put all of our life our faith and trust in you. As we learn those things, God, help us to share those things. Help us to not keep your message, your good news inside the, the walls of this church, but to get outside these walls and share with others the good news of what you came to do and what you succeeded in doing. We love you and we praise you. Amen.